welcome to Mo Law Now. My name is Cindy Lash and I'm the editor of Missouri Lawyers Media. Our guests today are attorneys Amanda J. Schneider and Hopi Fink of Legal Services of Eastern Missouri's Education Justice Program. Amanda is managing attorney of the program's Health Justice Initiative and Hopi is an education advocate for the program. In this back to school season, whether that means back to in-person school, virtual school, or a combination of both, Amanda and Hopi are joining us to discuss how school districts in Missouri might reimagine their programs in response to COVID-19 in ways that protect the rights of all students to a free public education, particularly the most vulnerable students in our communities. They also have ideas on how other Missouri attorneys can help with this mission. So welcome, Amanda and Hopi. Good morning. Good morning. First of all, can you tell us about the Education Justice Program and its mission? What, what do you do and what do you aim to do? Absolutely. So our mission for the work is really centered around achieving education equity for all Missouri students. We utilize a race equity lens and we're always trying to think of ways to reach the community, especially those that don't always get to us through those ordinary means, like through our usual intakes that we do. So we really make a concerted effort to um, work on our community outreach and engagement with the community um, as part of our everyday legal practice. Um, the goal of our work is really to look at impact issues um, that can better, again, the education for all students in Missouri, children of color, children with disabilities, in particular, the most vulnerable of the students um, in Missouri. So no doubt you've both been observing and monitoring as school districts across Missouri have released and revised and released and revised back to school plans in the past few weeks. What are you seeing out there through your lens that concerns you most? Well, I think what we are seeing now is um, more than more than last spring, we are seeing some attempts, I think, at trying to offer education to students. We will say that. But we think that um, given what we learned from last spring when schools closed, you know, abruptly, um, we think that um, really offered this opportunity, and it still exists today, again, to really rethink everything. Um, importantly, parents and students still have rights under Missouri law. They did not go away um, when the pandemic occurred and schools closed. And so the issues that we're seeing is probably sort of the lack of really trying to reach those most vulnerable populations. That's probably what concerns us the most. We know that this is, again, a unique time and we're all trying to come up with ways to ensure education is provided. But I'm not sure we're seeing the focus that we would like to see on those most vulnerable populations. And we're talking about children who are experiencing homelessness, who may be even more disengaged from the school setting than ever before. Um, we're seeing concerns in particular around enrollment of those students and disenrollment of those students over the summer. Um, we're still hearing a lot of concerns about um, how children with disabilities are being served during this time. We're really encouraging schools to, to again, thinking, think outside the box as much as possible and really ensure that they are still offering a free appropriate public education to those students as well. If anything, in the past few months, the pandemic has made us all more dependent on technology to establish and maintain these connections. But a recent report from the nonprofit Common Sense Media found that 36% of Missouri students lack adequate internet connectivity for virtual learning, and that those students are disproportionately Black, Latinx, and Indigenous. So what does that mean for schools or for, for school districts and, and these students that they're serving? This is a huge challenge, frankly, um, and it's something that schools, as Amanda said, have been trying to work on. Um, since the spring when, when school had to close abruptly. Um, but right off the bat, there's been an unequal playing field because before the pandemic, school districts had very different um, access to resources um, for students, whether that's devices like Chromebooks or other laptops, technology like that, or even just um, internet 
access. Um, like you said, that statistic points out that there's a huge disparity in who can actually log on, even if they do have a device. So we're seeing um, on multiple levels, um, just a huge challenge for schools and for families. Um, districts are trying to, to accommodate with devices, but we have been concerned that there have been some districts charging fees or um, not always accommodating in the ways that they could and that they must sort of under the under Missouri law. Well, the fees that you mentioned, I mean, that's not appropriate, is it? The, edu the education is to be provided to, to all students, correct? Yes, we believe, right, we believe any charge of a fee without making it very clear that it can be waived is unconstitutional. However, this is a new time for us. So certainly, you know, we, this is a new situation where um, never before has, again, technology been that central focus of how education is being implemented. So we do think some school districts may not even be fully aware that that is the case and that they need to revise their traditional practice of how they uh, distribute Chromebooks or even have families sign waivers of liability to get those Chromebooks, for example, especially concerning those students we mentioned earlier, those homeless students absolutely, you know, need those needs need to be considered and it's not only about handing out that Chromebook, it's about following through with really making sure that family also has access to the internet. And even beyond that, is there, is there actual support to ensure that child is gonna be able to be learning? That child is in a shelter system where they're not even able to um, turn on or have internet access there. Is there another location that perhaps the school district needs to consider um, perhaps like a childcare location where that child can go to daily to get some level of supervision, to get some access to instruction. Again, these are just really creative ways to ensure equal access under the law for homeless students. That's just one example and, and one subset of the population. Um, but that's exactly what we're trying to say through um, reimagining everything. That's, that's part of what we need to be doing is really, again, knowing that the laws are still in place during this time, but also thinking creatively how we can ensure, again, access. And you've mentioned homelessness a couple of times. Um, one of the grimmer statistics and grimmer trends that appear to be coming out of the pandemic is that that is a situation as uh, moratoriums expire on evictions and foreclosures, that that situation is likely to get only worse. Um, what, how, how can school districts in Missouri go about, you've talked about creative ways, how can they go about making that situation better, first for identifying students that might not always be um, obvious that they're homeless, and then how, how to help them best? That edu sorry, the identification part is so key because um, the coverage under the McKinney-Vento um, Act is that's a federal law that protects students who are experiencing homelessness and it covers a lot of students who might not be um, might not come to mind uh, for for lay people when you think of homelessness and so making sure that there is training for staff at schools um, for homeless liaisons whose whose job it is to do that identification that's I, the, the foundational um, important point here. Um, and then moving forward, just looking at how to proactively um, identify students, um, as Amanda mentioned, not dising, disenrolling students over the summer, um, and then working with families um, to, to meet them where they're at. What about families that are grappling with uh, special education ser services and the challenges of remote learning. I, I personally know a couple of families that are dealing with how do you maintain safety for your child, but also make, maintain the services that the child uh, not just is entitled to, but desperately needs. That is yet another challenge that, yeah, we're also hearing about from, from our clients as well. I think importantly, first and foremost, School districts must still offer a free appropriate public education. And as we mentioned with this whole topic, again, thinking 
creatively about how those services can be you know, provided and implemented. In St. Louis City and St. Louis County, and I believe in, in Kansas City, a lot of schools are still closed, but not statewide. And so there are just some lessons to be learned about. So if there are alternatives to just providing virtual education, is there any way to rethink possibly in a safe manner that services can be delivered, perhaps one-on-one -on -one in, in another setting, again, where social distancing is applied, you're wearing a mask. I, I just think we do, if this continues longer, if schools remain closed for longer, especially um, in these hot spots, can those considerations be made? Um, because as certainly the guidance that's been put out by the U.S. Department of Education allows some flexibility, but it, does, it, it itself brings up all of these other alternatives and possibilities. And, and we know, um, we hope, that schools would be looking more forward thinking in that direction if this continues for longer. Um, it may also just mean, just like we've been talking about homeless students and considering their needs, might mean prioritizing the needs of these students, especially the students with the most severe disabilities, who we know if they are just provided this virtual education, they will likely fall so far behind that it will be very difficult for them to recoup. Um, another, another theme that is important, though, is that for those students who are losing out so much, it's important that parents and students are documenting this regression and presenting that information to schools because they should, these students who are falling behind because of this, should be offered compensatory services or whatever name the schools would like to call it to bring these students back up to where they should have been before the pandemic. And I will say we're already hearing that schools are, are suggesting that they won't be providing those services because they believe, you know, we are all in good faith trying to work through this. Our position would be just, it, it's okay, first of all, if it was even offered in good faith, that still does not undermine perhaps the need to really put those students' interests first really think about what these students with disabilities need and put that first in the conversation um, and really work together again to, to really consider the best interests of those students. So how does your program go about um, monitoring or implementing or making suggestions? I mean, do you, how, how do you work with school districts in a way that, I mean, you've talked about creative reimagery uh, as, as opposed to a, a punitive a, a punitive action after the fact. How, how does your program work with school districts to try to make things happen up front? Well, I will say if we must file litigation, we will and we have, but you're right. We do try to, um, along with our community partners, collaborate with districts because we know that um, if we can come together, it means better things can happen sooner, right, for, for children. And so we do try to collaborate um, whenever we're offered the opportunity to give input and guidance. Um, we also try to collaborate with, with the state similarly in order to um, issue important guidance for districts in Missouri. Um, but we always, we kind of rely on um, really what we're hearing from, from parents and from families and from, from community partners about where those opportunities might be um, and where the problems are that need to be addressed. Uh, so we always welcome those conversations. I see. Uh, you've also talked about school districts uh, needing to revamp discipline practices, suspensions, alternative education to reflect the realities of living during COVID. I mean, what, what does that look like? This is something that uh, the landscape is really unknown. A lot of districts that we haven't seen a lot of districts rewriting their, their discipline codes, um, but we know that issues are coming up and we've seen in the news in other states, um, you know, students getting in trouble for things like um, disagreeing about the COVID social distancing if they're in person. We know there are questions that come up for virtual learning even. What, what happens when someone does something on screen that, you know, isn't, isn't appropriate according to the school um, or truancy with, you know, um, 
in inequitable access to the internet. Um, if a student is absent, how, are, how is that going to be factored in? So these are all questions that we are monitoring um, closely, and we think that this is a chance for, for districts to, um, to rethink what, how they're approaching discipline um, in general with suspensions and expulsions and a right to alternative education. Um, this is a time when so many students are online or, on vir or virtual, and previously um, many of the students who were using online programs were students who had been um, removed long term from from the classroom for disciplinary reasons and those programs um, left a lot to be desired in terms of their actual education they're providing so we think that now that um, so many schools so many students are, are online for their regular classrooms that this is a chance to really um, redesign alternative education as well so how can other Missouri attorneys help you advocate for Missouri students in, in this in this particular aspect of the landscape? Well, I think there's always an opportunity for certainly for school district lawyers themselves to ensure that their clients are advised that all of the rights, you know, that were previously in place before a pandemic are still are still here and alive and well. And we need to all ensure, especially for for reasons of education equity um, to ensure that that is still happening. Um, but I think any, any attorney, um, especially any attorney who is the parent of, the, of a child who's, they're probably all struggling and slugging along, I think we all can think creatively about how we can come together and, and really talk you know, through some of these issues and collaborate um, you know, with school districts in, in helping and change some of these practices. Um, and, and sort of recognizing that we're now playing, playing different roles every day in this whole experience. And how can we take those lessons learned and actually bring those back to the practice of law, I think is really, is really important. And it's, it's absolutely vital is what we would say at this time. One more oh, I was just going to add that um, just the, the racial justice lens that we use in our work is something that all attorneys could and should be using too. Um, education um, intersects with so many other areas of the law. And so bringing that lens into whatever work you're doing as an attorney, um, is this is a, a really good moment to start doing that. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you somewhat anticipated my question more specifically, how can they help legal services with your education justice program? Well, if anyone is interested in, in volunteering with us, they absolutely can reach out to me um, and we can talk about what those opportunities might look like. We're already hearing from, from a lot of folks in the, in the community who especially have concerns about the digital divide. So I think separate and apart from, from as lawyers, what we can do as advocates, we can start to also think about um, non-legal solutions, policy solutions, um, including addressing some of these really um, significant needs that are being faced, in particular um, with children who don't have any access to devices or technology or that parent facilitator to help support the learning. So we're, you know, we're always welcoming those conversations to really think creatively about legal and non-legal solutions, and we would welcome that opportunity to um, kind of think that through together. And just to help us issue spot as well, um, we do this community lawyering model, which means we are really interested in what is happening on the ground. So if you're an attorney and you have a client who has an education issue um, or you see trends, that's something that we, our program would, would like to know about. Thank you. Once again, our guests today are attorneys Amanda J. Schneider and Hopi Fink of Legal Services of Eastern Missouri's Education Justice Program. Thank you both for joining us. I'm sure our audience has been intrigued and challenged by your insight and grateful to have learned more about your work. And I'm Cindy Lash for Mo Law Now. Thank you.